And welcome to this episode of the Selling Through Partnering Skills podcast, where I'm delighted to be joined by Anthony Kandouris, uh, who is the author of a book called Run Frictionless, which I read, uh, found incredibly useful, chatted to him, found that incredibly useful, and thought, wait, we need to share some of this stuff. So I invited him on the podcast, and uh, he's very kindly agreed to come. So, Anthony, welcome. Thanks, Fred, for having me on the show. Appreciate the time. No, I appreciate your time. I know we're going to get a load of good stuff. So um, let's just crack on. Let's let, let's not mess around. Let's let's start to uh, share some of these ideas. So j- just a little bit about you know yourself and what, what your background is. That would be useful to set stuff up. Yeah, sure, Fred. I design and build sales systems for enterprise uh, startups across Asia Pacific. So I've been doing that for a number of years. And um, each time I, I start a new gig, I'm given a couple of months to show results. So when I'm trying to help uh, scale a, uh, a business owner or sales leader out of a sales role, uh, I use a framework I design called the four Qs. Four Qs is absolutely what I read about. Loved it. Loved the simplicity of it. Um, and I, of course, to make something simple, it involves a hell of a lot of work. Um, so... I mean, in this, before we get into the four cues, when we were talking, <laughs> and this isn't the only reason why I want to on the podcast, you mentioned that you're using the stuff that I wrote about in the way that that you're operating now. Um, so it's all about you know sales teams, how they go more from order taking solution selling. So if we could just touch on that, make it a little bit about me, and then you could have the rest of the podcast about you. How about that? <laughs> Works for me. Um, <laughs> you know, after reading your book, I, I realized there was a step missing in my approach. Um, you know, previously when I designed and built sales processes, I would simply identify friction within um, an organization and then design out that friction with the new sales process. Um, so the result was an improvement in sales performance across the entire sales organization. But what was missing was something fundamental. What mode of selling are we now? And what mode of selling do we want to be? I mean, I just never used to ask this question. So if a sales leader put this question to me, um, I would say, ask Fred. But today, I've actually got an answer, right? So I've been using the framework that you put together to explore the fact that it's important that we understand, um, you know, if we're shifting up from order taking, you know, what, or what you call classic selling in your book to consultative selling, or in other cases, are we downshifting from, say, solution selling to back to order taking? So this is becoming really imperative now. One of the very first things that I do during discovery calls with customers. Because I think when we're talking, what uh, we've chatted about this a couple of times, haven't we? That in some ways we can overcomplicate selling. We do too much stuff. We're almost trying to be too clever in what we do. And, and sometimes being too clever isn't clever. I think that's kind of what we're saying, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean... I, I felt like I needed to take a sort of a step back um, rather than just jumping in and start doing the work and, 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 and making assumptions. Like I just used to make assumptions that people wanted to shift to consultative selling, you know, and, but uh, I, now I, I begin to think about it. No, in fact, some organizations that I've been applying this to since we, since we had our conversations and I read your book, what I discovered is 25% of their business are engaged in consultative selling. And the other 75% are order takers. And now here comes the really interesting conversation about who's going to become part of the new sales process. Because in the past, we talked about you know, order takers are a bad thing. Oh, you don't want to be an order taker. It's all, it's all really bad. And in some ways, I guess, yeah, that, that, that's true. But what you're saying, if you've designed a good sales system, that is precisely what they should be doing because they're getting a the value. They're getting the other stuff as part of their whole journey. Yeah, right? wouldn't it be ideal if we could be in a situation, even as a business to business um, model where we could just order take like you would at McDonald's. And the question then just becomes, you know, would you like fries with that? I have built systems where we've got to that, but what was really interesting was we didn't begin with this because we didn't have enough intelligence to do it at the beginning. So what would happen is, is you know, we would do the classic situation, go from um, order taking, order getting, then on to consultative selling. And then once we got to consultative selling and we've done it maybe three or 400 times, 
we start to then re re reverse engineer and understand the customer profiles a lot better. And before they even open their mouth and start talking about themselves, we already know, you know, with, with great certainty what they're going to need. And now comes this opportunity to move gracefully back to a situation where we can start um, order taking. Yeah. And I mean, I think if people listen to this and are getting worried that we are saying death of the consultative salesperson, it, it isn't really like that because there's, there's many things that a salesperson will have to do to bring value. But uh, let, let's think about think about this sales system then. You talk about the four cues. Can you kind of give us a the, the whistle stop tour of it, and then we'll kind of break those down a little bit if we can. Mm, yeah. So I, I wrote the four cues because I needed a robust tool that addressed friction at like an organizational level, um, because reducing friction lifts sales performance of the entire sales organization and places less pressure on individual sales performance. So there, there's plenty of, of, of frameworks out there, but none of them um, are predicated on the reduction of friction and none of them um, are, are built with product market fit in mind. So a big influence came from Mark Ageson, the co-founder of Netscape, who coined the idea of product market fit. For a lot of us, Fred, you know, the fit was like a, a light globe moment. You know, he made this brilliant metaphor, you know, uh, rather than thinking about businesses like step one, two, three, like a process, like you just follow quite linearly. Um, Mark is saying that it's like one, two, and then one, uh, then two, and, and then one again, um, until you achieve a fit. So while I think his metaphor fit is, is really, really handy, um, I found that the product market is a little too broad and it needs to be more granular. So today, if you're using the 4Qs framework, there is something like eight different kinds of fits that we've isolated um, that we teach. And I'm sure there's, there's probably more if we, the deeper that we get into it. Sure. So can you just talk us through these different, these different cues or, or quadrants as they are? Yeah. Yeah. So the four cues short for four quadrants uh, is a decision-making framework and the power of the four cues rests in how it organizes people and processes into one or more quadrants such that everyone in the business has a clear picture of how their roles and decisions touch a customer, okay? So if I was to give you a summary of each of them, here I go, okay? Uh, quadrant one, who we serve, focuses on the customer profile. Um, quadrant two, what you serve is what we're serving to quadrant one. It's generally a product or a service. Quadrant three is who we are and it's ubiquitous. So unlike yeah. quadrant one and two, which you can get a fit between quadrant one and two. Quadrant three is about our belief. So it cuts across all three quadrants. And the last one, my favorite quadrant four focuses on uh, the precise number of interactions required to create a customer. It's how we serve. So once again, who we serve, quadrant two, what we serve, quadrant three, who we are, quadrant four, how we serve. These are the four different windows, if you like, of value that we can create when we serve a customer. Windows of value, oh, I love that. I also love the word serve. Again, very deliberate in why you're picking that. Can you just talk us through your thinking in why you're using that word serve? Yeah. Where did that come from, that word? You know, um, when I wrote the book, uh, I started to think that when we, let's just say that, that I have a free product in quadrant two, okay? I've got a free product. Uh, it's, a, it's a free trial for 14 days. Um, a lot of times organizations think that the moment that they've got a free product that we don't really have to support it. It's not really important. In effect, I'm really not serving you. And what became really important to me was every time we allow a customer to come into the organization, whether it be a free product, a paid product, a rental product, we have to serve them. We are actually obliged to serve them. And so that's when I started to then think about, oh, well, then we're going to need consistent experiences that we need to create in quadrant four. Like what are the precise interactions they're going to serve? But we're going to serve them to make sure that we actually do it. So that's where that word 
started to come from. It's an obligation that we have as an organization. The moment that we say we're taking you in or we're letting you come into our organization, we are now obliged to serve you. I love it. I mean, I, I've done a little bit of work and some thinking around the salesperson as a, as a servant leader um, because of what they can do with customers and sometimes that they do need to lead them not not in a manipulative way and that was kind of one of the things that that i that i like when i I was reading i also love this whole the balance because i come across salespeople who tend to be imbalanced in what they do in that you know some people are totally focused on product 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 let me talk about features 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 it's like no stop it you're boring people some people customers but it's not a customer focus. It's how many people can I stuff in the pop, top of this pipeline? Numbers, logos. And it's like, mm, you're missing the point here. You know, how do we do it? Some people, again, it's so process focused. My process, sales process, something you do to somebody. They're like, no, it doesn't work like that these days. And of course, the, the who we are, the really selling from a point of your beliefs and you know, aligning that, that makes it incredibly um or to incredibly attractive, you know, when you're talking to somebody who who believes and then thinks the same way as you. So I, I just love the way that you can use the quadrants to balance these up, which made so much sense at every level. You know, even for an individual yeah. salesperson can get their head around that and realize, yeah, I've got to balance myself out like this. You know, um, I think as well with the word serve, it just brings us back to not thinking about our company's goals, you know, like meeting quota, but like putting us back in a situation where, um, although the customer has bought the product yet, um, they're still experiencing what it's like to be with our firm. And so if I'm not helping them achieve their goal, whatever that might be, then I'm not serving them. Yeah. And um, I've, I've heard quite a few people whose, whose opinions I respect who talk about that actually the, 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 the buying experience is, is potentially the only differentiator that you're going to have anyway. I know you would say, well, no, come on, Fred, if you're doing the four cues properly, you can you can build the actual product, you can build the service. So it's truly different. But often if it is things that are, you know, quite samey, quite similar, how you do stuff, that that, that that's Q4, right? Yeah, it um, certainly is. That's the bit you'll need to be focusing on whilst trying Especially to change your for... Q2 product. Yeah. yeah uh, you know, that's normally where... Work. Yeah, I, I think... Um that's normally where like a lot of startups try to get an angle against more established enterprise companies is by leveraging um, quadrant four and getting a quadrant one four fit. They try to go for a better quadrant one four fit where they know they'll have an inferior product in quadrant two. They're just hoping that the experience of actually signing up to or the experience of leading up to the transactions is gonna be so much better than another organization that that customer will think, wow, if it's this good, just signing up, imagine how fantastic the product's going to be. So cool. And so another another bit of language that again, because I've taught you and I've picked up <laughs> that you use a lot. You talk about these fits. You talk about one, two fits, one, three fits, one, four fits. And it just took me, it took me a while to realize that actually you don't go one, two, three, four depending where you're at what you're doing that's where you pick well actually which fit which way of operating can i get biggest bang for my bucks that that was a light bulb moment for me it's not just do that do that do that do that it's like no actually if you do that bit it makes most sense can, can you talk a little bit more around that wow that's very neat um yeah it's so your model that's why it's neat <laughs> what, well one of the ways i suppose it helps sales leaders is they can actually cordon off a conversation. So you can say, look, today we're talking about a quadrant one, two fit. Oh, you want to discuss customer experience? No, 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 that's not what we're describing today. We're going to talk about a byproduct of a quadrant one, two fit, that's revenue. Let's talk about how the features map to the customer profiles that we serve. So it allows people to understand the nature of a decision that's being made or take a decision in a certain way where they can say this month, we just want to invest in say quadrants one and two. That's where our emphasis is going to be. Um, three and four might be next month. So on one level, it just gives you a chance to really become quite direct about the kinds of conversations you want to have. Everybody understands the gravity of the decisions being made because irrespective of whether you're from 
product, customer care, marketing, sales, or you're the CEO of the company, um, when we use, well, when you understand the fundamentals of the four Qs, there's no longer any more smokescreen because we can't use jargon that people don't understand. So we understand the gravity of the decision. And lastly, we can calculate our resources. So we can say, well, how many people do we have pinned in quadrant two? And why is it that the discussions are dominated by quadrant two? I've been in organizations where I've started a sales process and I go, look, please, can we just have one day a week where we just talk about quadrant three? Or we just talk about quadrant four. Why is it that every day we talk about quadrant two? There's other value that we can create for customers. Quadrant two product. My short answer for that would be because it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> and also so many people with product trains do it in an inch of their life. <laughs> We wake up talking features and it is features as well. I, I deliberately talk about that, you know, um, either features that exist or features that don't exist, even worse, because you, you talk about future cell, don't you, quite a bit. And that being not a good thing at all. Just talk to us about future cell because probably some people listening who think, oh, slightly guilty or very, very guilty. So, future cell is when the definition we've given in the book is when you. Um, try to make a sale today based on features that you're going to try and produce tomorrow. Okay. And so what you're doing is you're creating a moving target. Um, like check out this dialogue. Okay. So if, um, if I, if I call, if a customer calls us, if I, if I do an outbound telephone call, right. Calling a client and say, uh, we're opening it. We're opening a new office next month. I say, fantastic. Call me back next month. Okay call back. Oh, we've got this fantastic feature coming out next month. Shall I call you then? Yeah, call me back next month. Okay. And so if I'm always talking in the future, first of all, it's really easy to, to just ignore me because, well, I'll just call back when it's done, right? And then we can, then we can talk about it. Um, so that's one kind of uh, trap, if you like. But the other more sinister trap is when you mix visionary messages with sales messages. And that's typically what happens with a lot of business owners where they go from like that visionary 15 minute uh, around the water cooler speech, where they're at 40,000 feet, giving that visionary speech that wow, wows people, gets people really excited, brings the future now, makes it more tangible, staff begin to think that the tasks ahead are gonna be easier. Okay, so they do that really, really well. And I think all of us have seen when people do that really, really well. But then what happens is, is that a few minutes later, they pick up a sales call, which is, you know, flying at four feet where the rubber meets the road and start mixing those um, uh, future or visionary messages with the product that's today. And then people become confused. Like I've seen whole companies just become confused about what features are in the product today um, because they've been listening to so much or hearing so much future sell going on that they've actually um, convinced themselves of their own lies. And so if I interrogate that company and say, look, I'm gonna you know, check out their, compare what the online or the online chat people say about the product versus the telephony people versus the people looking after um, email correspondence, I'll invariably get different versions of the product that I'm getting, different feature sets. Um, and, and it's because of this issue uh, that we're just describing convince themselves of their lies and, and in some ways they're they're probably not malicious lies they're not bad lies they, they, they're sometimes done with right intent sometimes i mean the way i see this and i've seen this loads in sales people is you know the customer says oh you know will it be able to do this and they just say yes because it's easier you know as in well we'll go back and they'll be able to develop that we've got clever people in r&d if i just say yes and the customer will like me you know there's, there's all that thing and it's just it's an easy conversation and they, they just make life as you say incredibly difficult back at the ranch and with like no it doesn't well i've told them it does no customer we've got to make it happen now and it throws everything off track doesn't it i so, said so, so, yeah, from a, you know, a sales point time. of view sometimes it's well what, what would you what would you recommend then you know a customer is excited about a potential prospect they ask something it isn't part of the feature set how how do we deal with that? Apart from, you can't just say, nah, don't be stupid, don't do that. <laughs> What's the elegant way of dealing with that, that kind of conversation? Well, you know, really smart buyers um, 
after you know listening to somebody say yes for the fifth time start to twig that there's something there's something amiss here um, because there's no such thing as a product that does everything like <laughs> physical products don't do everything and neither does software um, and so therefore everything including human beings have limitations so if the salesperson is not describing those limitations a pretty smart buyer will, will start to cotton on that something's wrong um, what i think is the smart thing to do in quadrant two is first of all let's get the product people to write to write the features um, as they're released with every subsequent release of the software so every time the code's released it becomes part of the public code um, Let's make sure that the product people, not the marketing people, the sales people, but the product people write the features. And from those features that get written down, subsequently marketing sales can then borrow from that document, from that specification to try to, to, try to get to a, a single point of source of truth, okay, about what our product does. That's, I think, a really useful thing. Most companies could benefit from doing that. But I think if you really want to be, um, if you want an edge, in quadrant two, you want to map limitations and work around. So what that means is not only do we understand our features, but I know you so well as a customer that I know the limitations that you're going to encounter with my product before you even talk about them. I'm preparing and anticipating it. I've already got it. I've already got workarounds planned for you. And quite often these workarounds um, may not be necessarily, there could be third party software that perhaps APIs with your software, or they could be um, manual processes that can be done, but it's not so, doesn't introduce so much friction that the customer can't get the, the core benefit of the product. I, I love that idea, just being very clear on the limitations, clear on the workarounds. And, you know, lots of people say, oh, I'm not going to tell a customer it can't do something. I think it's actually very impressive to say, now, I know you, Mr. Customer, and I know you're probably going to ask me, will it do this and this and this? Yeah, which is a perfectly reasonable question. It doesn't at the moment. It is something we will potentially work on. But for here and now, this is what you do to achieve the outcome that you're essentially asking me for. That is such yeah. an impressive way of operating. Because we're like, wow, that's cool. You do know me. You get me. Cool. And then there's no lie. There's no deceit. There's nothing sort of hidden. Um, so yeah, that, that 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 makes a load of sense. A load of sense. There's, they have two ways there that they could flick it. Um, if they follow that advice, where they look at quadrant three on three levels, which is features. That's what most people are just trying to get right. But features, limitations, map limitations to the to the customers in quadrant one, and then and then the known workarounds. Um, what you can also do is is you remember in quadrant one you've got that whole thought about who we serve tomorrow. So some customers what you can do is, is you can say look i know i know what you're looking for we don't serve you today because i know that this is a mission critical feature you need hats down we don't do it but it's on our product roadmap it's coming in the next three to six months why don't i put you on a waiting list we'll get ready to serve you tomorrow so what you can do is you can take that limitation one or two ways you can either say we can bridge it with a workaround or we can say no, I'm not going to try and blow my trust here. I'm going to maintain our relationship and our integrity. Let's serve you in three to six months. Such an important line there again. I'm not going to blow my trust. Yeah, <laughs> so key. Um, because that's what you would do. Basically, it's like, well, you said you could do that. It didn't happen. How can I now believe anything, anything else that you say? I love it. I want to just spend a little bit of time as well talking about the the area that we probably don't go down you know talking about customers you know about them about their needs about their wants yeah that's what good sales people do talk about you know product like we said features hopefully advantages and benefits as well but you talked about this other quadrant where we talk about beliefs so who are we why is that so important you know why, why have you, you given that it's kind of it's, its whole quadrant what can we get from understanding that and, and, and using that well you know, Fred, back when our first conversation that we had, if I cast your memory back there, um, you know, one of the things you described was you started talking about customers that you never serve and then probing you a little bit deeper, then you started to talk about um, 
the, what some of the ones that you don't serve, you never serve in quadrant one is because of misalignment of values. And it's really interesting because that's a very mature um, perspective and not a lot of companies and salespeople understand this, that if customers don't share your belief, your chances of trying to sell them a product at a quadrant two are pretty much almost zero. Uh, for example, right, a couple of years ago, we started to build presentation presentation slides, pitch decks for, for businesses. Um, and one of the things that we would teach their salespeople to do is we said, look, the first five slides are going to be dedicated to who we are as quadrant three. Okay, and who we are in quadrant three specifically, it's on two levels, but the most important level we're looking at addressing right now is shared beliefs. The the power is not in the word belief, vision, mission, whatever you want to use, whatever the word you feel like using, that's, a, that's the flavor of the day. It's in the word share, right? And because I can have a mission or a value or, or, or a belief, but if nobody shares it, there's no value there. No one cares. No one's listening. So the first five slides we would dedicate to the unique problem we're trying to solve and the approach that our organization is taking. There's no discussion about product. The product might come in the next 15 slides. The first couple of slides were dedicated to discerning if our customer shares our belief. And at the end of those five slides, I said to them, I want you to look around the room and you're looking for one of three things. You're looking for head nodding or you're looking for um, uh, people not caring, not really thinking about it, uh, or you're looking for hostility. Either one of these three are fine as outcomes. Obviously, the most important one would be um, head nodding. You want to hear the customer say phrases like, oh, my God, I've been telling people this for years, Fred. Finally, someone's come along and built this product. You see, they have this great sense of belonging to you. They think that you've been personally listening to them. And it's now going to get so much easier when the, when the conversation arrives to quadrant two, start talking about products and features. Everything's going to move so much more smoothly. But if you don't hook them, if you get hostility and they turn around and go, this, this is absolute bollocks. Get out of my office. I don't want to talk about this rubbish. You're like, well, fantastic. We don't have to talk about the product and waste 15 slides of my life because now we know we don't share beliefs. Yeah, and, and don't try and change that. I mean, good luck trying to change someone's belief, eh? So that's cool. Right, we're not aligned. That's cool. We've established that early. Happy days. And if you win some, you lose some. The ones you win will be so much more attracted. They'll be so much stickier. They'll be so much closer to you. You use the word belonging. Again, love it. And the ones that aren't, okay, well, they never were going to be. So save yourself some time. Great. Spot on. Great, great stuff. And yeah, so the way to present it, I mean, you know, hopefully people are really getting it now that, you know, the slide deck shouldn't be, you know, map of the world. Here's all our locations. Here's a bunch of logos people we work with, you know, founders. There's a picture of the guy setting it up in 1892. Little garage in the new <laughs> You know, what? Why are you telling me these things? It's here are problems your industry's facing here's how we go about dealing with them broadly because this these are our beliefs this is you know fundamentally our person is what's driving us yeah whoa right no go carry on it's, it makes such sense really but it's amazing how many people just don't do it you know you're smiling at the the logos and the, the map of the world because people still do it they've they got this kind of fancy that people care about them <laughs> which they will start to care about them was what you're saying when the belief is shared. Of course, we're going to care. Yeah. Someone who thinks the same as me. <laughs> we're buddies. I, I, I also think that there's, um, you know, I think sometimes people uh, mix up their jargon as well. So what happens is um, when you talk about vision or you talk about beliefs, they have a misconception of the definition of the word and they confuse it with, um, I need to show credibility uh, by showing lots of offices and team shots. And, you know, we bring everybody to the meeting, you know, I bring my mum 
you know, got that next to me. We've got everyone here. Everyone's here to support you. You know, um, I remember going to some meetings with um, advertising agencies when we would bring the cleaning lady with us just to show how much solitude and we're right there for you. Um, uh, you know, there's plenty of people here to do all your work, you know, and it'd be like, um, no, no, it's not about the world maps and all the offices and, and, and you confusing this thought of credibility that you're trying to build with the belief or the vision and they have nothing to do with one another. They, they may be related, but uh, my purpose for getting up and coming to work every day is not to, not to be in an office somewhere in Europe. That's not, I don't want to be a dot on the map. That's not, that's not the purpose for my existence for this, why this company exists. Yeah, it's, uh, and I do think people are getting better at that. Or, or the ones, no, that, that's probably wrong. The ones that are good at it are very, very good at it and you get it and they become very, very attractive. And there's still people who are like, you know, they, they again, they get, they misunderstand the, the story. The way I understand the story is that my story is this. And that's what drives, you know, gives me the purpose. But the story is right. You know, back in the day, this is what happened and, 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 and so what, you know, what, what does that actually lead into? How does that feed into what you're all about now? And are we similar in the way that we think? Yeah, really important stuff. Really important. Harder for salespeople to um, to to explain, I think, sometimes, but not impossible. You know, we can we can teach and we can help them. You know, we can give them the guidance in how to get that part out because that that does make the whole offer very compelling, doesn't it? It's part and parcel. It does, and I think part of it is not because they haven't been trained but maybe the business leaders and even their HR don't do a great job of reinforcing, um, you know, those, what, what the belief is of the company. Um, one of the important parts of quadrant three and how even the staff feel it right is through their interactions that they serve in quadrant four. So there's a, there's a dual experience that's occurring. Like if I'm, if we're having an interaction with a customer, not only am I sharing the belief with the customer, but I'm sharing it back with myself. I'm reinforcing the reason why I come to the office every day. And um, a classic situation, Fred, was I remember working with one organization where they just finally had this epiphany um, about this. And the salespeople ceased to write the title, sales managers, um, sales executives, that all went. And they started using the titles they used was change consultant and so they were no longer selling software they decided that as an organization the belief that we have is we're helping companies to transform we know a lot about change and i'm going to come into your organization and share this belief with you and talk about the kinds of risks that you're facing trying to make change it it makes such a difference i mean i i, I can speak from personal experience that it I don't know what the right word is, whether it's self-fulfilling or, or self-actualizing or, or probably a mixture of both, that when you do it, you do it better. You're more compelled to do it. You do more of it. You're more aligned with people. You have more fun at work. It's a pleasure doing business with folk. And it, it's all great compared to when you're in that kind of trying to persuade people that aren't really that bothered. And it's kind of just grinds you down because you're kind of fighting against them. It's like, oh, really? Another day of the... You know, <laughs> that it makes it makes so much sense it makes more sense self-perpetuating maybe you, you'll have the right word for it i'm sure <laughs> oh cool so i mean we, we have touched really on all, all those quadrants you know we, we've talked about um we talked about the product we've talked about the customer we've talked about beliefs and very briefly we've talked about how we go about doing stuff um what is there anything that we've not touched on that we really need to get across in this podcast for people who are listening? Any kind of major elements that I've not, <laughs> I've missed the point on. <laughs> I, I think, uh, I think that's been quite good. Uh, you know, I, I do have some recommendations about, um, you know, what, uh, what salespeople could be doing in addition to, to listening to this cast. Like for instance, for example, I really think they ought to read your book, find out, figure out what mode of selling you are and where you want to go. Um, check out Run Frictionless to help you uh, design and, and, and create your own uh, sales process. And then definitely pick up um, 
Brendan McAdams book, uh, Sales Craft, because he's quite clever in the way that he takes like, uh, he talks about how to go from say systems, what we've been talking about today, down to just routines and habits, good sales habits to get into. Brilliant. That, so that sounds like a decent reading list to me. <laughs> No, I'm not just saying that because you recommended me on that. But um, so, yeah, so selling through partnering skills, run frictionless and sales craft. And that's yep. Brendan McAdam. Yeah, that's Brendan McAdam. So uh, he's, uh, he's from the US. <clears throat> well, oh, what, what, what a multinational team you've got there. <laughs> Australia, UK, US. Unbeatable. Yeah, it's the UN, the of, UN are getting better everybody. at selling. <laughs> um, so thinking of run frictionless you've got loads of material available you're very very generous in promoting this and again that's kind of aligned with your beliefs that we can help people to get better um on your website there's there's a load of good stuff i mean i i've, I've had a play i've used some of that what would be the first thing you would point put someone towards once they got on your website and there's there's all these things what would be the, the sort of the number one bit to start the journey as they go they go deeper and deeper yeah, I think um, I'm just beginning with the four cues. Fact sheet's probably not a bad thing. Uh, so if you go over to the run runfrictionless.com and then have a look under the, the page titled four cues framework, um, there's a free fact sheet that people can download um, and take a look at that. And that gives you a lot of context, um, how to use it, how to, how to implement it into your company. Because a lot of what we didn't talk about today was well, how do we actually implement it? So we got to a part where we talk conceptually, but they can explore the adoption of it, which is really interesting. You know, one of the things that I dig, it's easy for me to blow my own trumpet, but I, I dig the framework because there's no rollout. You know, there's no software. You don't have to read lots of books. There's no workbooks you have to do. Um, they're optional, right? Like there's a, there's a free playbook that people can use after they read the book. Um, there's books if they want to read the book, but you don't have to because if you read the fact sheet and you listen into a couple of podcasts like the one we're doing, um, actually, you can just start using it tomorrow. All you have to do is use the language. You start using the language that we described today. You can begin bringing the four cues into your organization. No big rollouts, no grand Thing, no grand changes we have to make to the company. You just insidiously start using the terminology and then people will begin using it around you. Yeah. Uh, mate, wait, when you write a book called Run Frictionless, <laughs> the adoption implementation has to be pretty frictionless in itself, you know. Um, but, I mean, I know you, you can help and you can kind of speed that up and you can make it easier and you can take it deep with people. So how... How can they get in touch with you? What's the best way? Yeah, so either head over to runfrictionless.com um, and they can book a session time just to meet up and have a virtual coffee uh, or uh, jump on LinkedIn and just um, key search Anthony Condoris and you'll find me on LinkedIn. You can connect with me there. I would recommend both of those. Certainly the virtual coffee. You know, uh, you're a very generous guy on the amount of info you will share and help you will give um and i know as you said to me as a friend it's not it's it's not completely that you know magnanimous because i'm learning while i'm doing it you know which which is great you know we, we, we talk about win-win a lot and you'll say no, this is cool because while i'm doing it i'm hearing things i'm refining if it goes further great if not well we all leave the conversation better you know so i would massively recommend that thanks fred any last things you want to say because I, you already told us loads and I think it's a, it's a really, really useful podcast. Any last things, party shots? Um, there is a, a, often a question that I'm posed, a question I get asked a lot even today. I was uh, delivering a session to a bunch of uh, sales leaders and um, the first question they asked me is, should I strike a quadrant one, two fit before I chase a one, three fit? And this is a debate that has just gone on for years now since I wrote the framework. And I tell you, when I have certain conversations, I get these real sort of disciplinarians say, it's a, it's a quadrant one, three fit or the highway, right? And then, <laughs> and then you get the other group, right? 
like the shareholders and maybe maybe even the staff who want to be paid and go, it's a quadrant one, two fit, no revenue, no investment. So what do you think, Fred? What's it, what's it for you? <laughs> I, I can't see why you can't do both you know why do you throw if 100 percent at one of those when you could do a bit of both and it's it's more magnetic anyway one one two is custom products so, okay we get the right stuff to sell to the right people happy days but if we can do that by underpinning it and talking to people that share what we want it's just it's just going to be far more compelling so yeah i'd have my cake and eat it if I can, well, I, can. I know I can. <laughs> um, so that I don't think it's even a choice. It's easy, but I, I can see why people can get a bit, bit wrapped up about it. <laughs> You're right. I think you can you can a, a, a appropriate time where in the in the next week you could appropriate time to really do a proper you know job on quadrants one and two, and then the next week you flip and then you go right. I'm going to really look at quadrants one and three. One of the interesting I think takeaways for today for for people listening, folks that sales leaders who are thinking about this is you need to get your, your, your business leaders or your CEOs to really nail what that belief is and start sharing it because um, the, the belief will give you the scale. It will give you the, it'll, it'll prevent you churning customers and prevent you from churning staff. And that's going to give you the scale. So when people talk about how do I scale my business, um, if you don't get a quadrant one, three fit, the consequences are pretty dangerous by the, sort of third or fourth year of operating your company, you're going to start to get really tired from the churn in the customer base and the churn in the staff. And I know that because in my first company, I was a victim of only ever thinking about a quadrant one, two fit. I used to just think that quadrant three, what's this consulting bollocks rubbish. Um, this is for people that don't want to cold call. So every time somebody tells them to cold call, they say, let's talk about our beliefs. Mysteriously, people start talking about their beliefs every time they're going to do cold calling. <laughs> no, but seriously, I, I, I think that you can prolong it for a little while. You can put it off, but the larger you get, the more scale issues you have if you don't strike a quadrant one, three feet. Brilliant. Such cool advice. Um, and, and just to underline, runfrictionless.com. Find you on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, really, I think every level of sales, get your head around this stuff. Uh, it, it, it is going to make you better, ultimately. Happy Thanks so for much it. for your time, Anthony. I really, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. See you again. Thank you.